I started my PhD in Central Africa in the Hubangi River, there was no grammar for the local language. And then what I did is to write the grammar. And uh, this is what we have to do, uh, to master uh, the language of the people. This is our duty as anthropologists and sharing the daily life of, of people. But today I'm going to talk uh, about uh, the abuse, use and abuse of globalization in the field of mental health. Uh, uh, just a few words, and this will be very, very brief uh, about uh, what we do today as anthropologists. I think our methods have not changed uh, uh, much. We, we still very much produce local ethnographies, and we relied on uh, inter-society, inter-cultural comparisons, and uh, as well, we are more and more convinced that uh, uh, local societies have to be looked at within a region. We know that uh, uh, you develop your own uh, uh, value system, your practices uh, in comparing with neighbors. Uh, uh, we built our huts round because the other ones have square houses and then this means that, that we have to uh, look at uh, uh, the grounding of uh, uh, societies within uh, a particular location, but at the same time, the opening or unlocking of the boundaries. And uh, more and more than uh, we see particular culture being located on the border of many worlds, as well, uh, more and more critical, I will say today, of the hegemonic position of the Western civilization, because essentially we do believe that we have to understand any society in its own terms, using as much as possible the concept invented by people, the people, the member of that society, to see something about their own identity, who they are. And this is absolutely fundamental. And the relation, of course, to other languages, because we find plurality within societies. And uh, as well, today, we are absolutely convinced uh, that equality and the question of justice is fundamental. I decided to look at uh, this globalization uh, process uh, uh, using as an example Quebec, the society, my own society. Although I've spent uh, uh, 13 years in Africa and I've worked uh, on all continents around the world during the last 40, 40 years, uh, I did also a lot of work in Quebec. I produced all intellectuals, francophone intellectuals, before they died, they produced their own essay about uh, what is Quebec. And I will try to, <laughs> particularly for our friends, our visitors, uh, the number, a number of things. I do think that we have uh, to pass from a uni world to a multi world. And let's look at Quebec uh, as a post-national uh, society. And first of all, what is a nation exactly? Uh, we have uh, to keep in mind that a nation is a postulated uh, unit. It is more a project than an heritage. Uh, and the question, fundamental question, is what makes a nation hold together? And, uh, if we uh, look at what uh, Renan did, it's a suffering, uh, collective suffering is what allows a nation to hold together grief, pain, trauma at the beginning of the nation. In other words, nation uh, prosper best with strong enemies, 
than with strong allies. And that's a way to identify yourself as being, as being different. Then in his lesson on nationalism, uh, Rabbi Donat Tagore uh, rather says that uh, uh, India will be better served by a revival of its own cultural tradition, immense tradition, rather than by a pale imitation of existing Western models. And he was referring to this notion, we can borrow other people's history. Then let's try to situate Quebec within its own history. Part of where you are is where you have been. If you aren't sure where you are, or if you are sure but don't like it, there is a tendency, both in psychotherapy and in literature, to retrace your history to see where you got there, how you got there. And this is Margaret Atwood who wrote that uh, in a beautiful book to know something about Canada. It's survival. Very, very beautiful book. Yeah. We are children of two empires. Je me souviens. Uh, you have seen that everywhere. I remember, born under the lily, born French, I've been raised English. I grew up under the rose. The first settlers, and this is written on the parliament in Quebec City. Je me souviens, né sous le lys, j'ai grandi sous la rose, and so on, and so on. It goes like that. Duality is inscribed within the foundation itself. Children of two colonial empires, French and English. And the first settlers who came, and my ancestor, 14 generations ago, when you arrived here, beginning of the 17th century, they have conquered the Amerindian land, which is the land or the island of the turtle, according to the Iroquois myth. That's interesting maybe to remind that McGill has been built precisely on the, what we call the Dawson archeological site where the very, very first contact with the French Jacques Cartier in 1534 uh, happened. It's here just along the, uh, the street, uh, Sherbrooke. That might be interesting to have a look at that. Uh, there is there something pretty close to where uh, James McGill stands today. It's a beautiful statue. <laughs> Quebec and Canada have invented their myth of foundation. As any other nation, it has nothing to do with real history. It's all invented. And here I'm quoting, quoting Ben Okri, a Nigerian uh, novelist. If nations tell themselves stories that are lies, they will suffer the future consequences of those lies. If they tell themselves stories that face their own truth, their contradiction, the trauma, what they did to other people, they will free their history. Multiple version of the Quebecois collective identity. Version one, which draws his image from the history of the Nouvelle France. The habitant, uh, the hockey uh, uh, team of Montreal is CH. It's not Canadian hockey, it's Canadian habitant. <laughs> The H stands for habitant, the habitant, or the people living here, who lives within sight of the tower of the parish church. This is still very much the way certain Anglo-Canada is looking at Quebec. But in addition to that, there was the voyageur, the explorers. Uh, the very first Bibo came, went to the Mississippi River down to what is today New Orleans then, and was given by the King of France, a small island here yeah, where during many generations people, people uh, stayed. Then the voyageur who ranges freely across the continent, intermarries 
with the Native Amerindian. In my study in Transgenic Quebec, I look at the interbreeding between the Francophone and the Amerindians. And there, we have the evidence that there was strong interchanges. And uh, that man, that voyageur, is only happy when out of the sight of the village church tower. You see the contradiction in the identity there. Version two, which is grounded in our Americanity. Are we Americans? I think so. And we are very American, as much as the people of the United States. French Canadian women had no more children and harder women in the American lands of colonization. Religion was not more invading than in any other Protestant region. It was even more invading among the Presbyterians in Ontario, for example. Version three, we are Canadians. The railway is the backbone of Canada. In 1885, two great events took place in parallel. The completion of the railway from Halifax to Vancouver. And the very same here, at the very same moment, the hanging of the Miti leader, Louis Riel, was French and Cree together. I'm not going to explain why this happened, but this is fundamental. And the Miti people as a nation have disappeared. The confederation uh, that started in 1867 with the union of four colonies and the expansion towards the west with Manitoba as a province, became province in 1871. And then we had to expose Amerindians and Miti people who were the owner of these lands. Our genealogy is postmodern. And a close look at our calendar of official celebration shows multiple contradictions which create room for invention. Let's look at our calendar just for a moment. We have no Columbus Day or Day of the Discovery. Nothing about that. No day consecrated, I would say, to uh, John Cabot. Giovanni Cabotto. <laughs> Francophone, we, when we refer, is uh, Jean Cabot, but the Anglo Canadian said John Cabot. He was coming from Bristol. He arrived in 1494 to Newfoundland, two years after Columbus landed, then in Hispaniola. And uh, we are no celebration for Jacques Cartier because that was impossible. Either you put a British will be the first, you put a Francophone, and that was not feasible. Uh, then what we do is that we celebrate uh, a Christian feast, La Saint-Jean, in June, 24 of June, and 1st July, the Canada feast, which is just a commemoration of a political event. The meeting in Charlottetown when the fathers of the Confederation decided about the union of four colonies. Yeah. And uh, you see how it's complex, the identity. And more complexity in the construction, contemporary construction. We will see how this globalization comes in. What has been erased from our collective memory? There is a poem, beautiful poem, all the spikes but the last. It's about the construction of the railway. Uh, we tame this demon, which is the, what well, we, we call the prairies. And, uh, and uh, this uh, writes out not a word in that poem about uh, the Chinese laborers who built, actually, the railways. 
and more fundamentally, not a word about the fact that we have killed, assassinated, sitting bull, crazy horse, and so many uh, Indian leaders. It looks like this beautiful book, novel by Kutze in South uh, Africa, waiting for the barbarians. We were trying to reach the frontiers and to go to Vancouver and then to cross those land and we have ignored that and many young people. It's silence in our book of history. We forgot that we are not the owners of this land. These are two tragic lies. And situating now Quebec in globalized world, massive immigration, a quarter of a million entering into Canada year after year, and between 50,000 and 60,000 in Quebec. And Quebec, by convention, has the right to receive 30% of all immigrants entering into Canada. You see that in 10 years, uh, it's a lot of people, a lot of people. And of course, this brings more heterogeneity in the society, a growing interest for intermixing, post-nationalism, and eventually the death of ethnic nationalism of the Francophone Quebec society. Under, and then I come to this question, under the pretext of protecting national identity, Francophone identity, we had uh, linguistic nationalism, Law 101. All foreign, all new immigrants have to learn French and to send their children to school in French. This is the reason why Montreal is probably the uh, three-lingual uh, city in the world where you find uh, the highest proportion of people will speak at least three languages, the native language, then French and English, or English, French, whatever, whatever the, the order. Then uh, people are discussing a lot about how to, uh, to protect uh, the historical culture, but at the same time opening, opening that. I, believe that we are entering into a post-national uh, moment and uh, it will not be easy uh, to develop this uh, new uh, society because it will imply a tension between active faithfulness to national identity but also allowing spaces for the expression of differences and uh, equal rights for all citizens. Debate is not over, but it says a lot about what means to be uh, a society uh, within uh, the globalized uh, uh, world of today. And from now, it will be, I'm going, I will go fast. I wanted, I've changed all my, my talk, I, I thought it was, would be useful to say something about, uh, about Quebec for all our friends that come from abroad. And uh, this idea that we live today in a more fluid, uncertain, floating space, and uh, we have to, to construct uh, our identity in that, uh, in that context. And uh, this, will be, this will have a, a clear impact on uh, eventually the genesis of certain problem. Uh, I would like to uh, uh, say something about uh, alterity uh, because the, I do think and I profoundly think that uh, it's not through a process of going back to our inner self that we construct the identity, but it's always in relation to alterity. Alterity, and then today, there is approximate alterity, but as well, of course, more distant alterity. And this has become 
uh, fundamental in the world of today. Um, I will just quote my wife, if you allow me, Ellen, <laughs> Ellen Corrin, uh, who says that the proliferation of signs, symbol representation may lead people, individual, to build new identities in combining a plurality of elements. I'm not afraid by multiplicity of symbols. I rather really sit with people who do think that this is the chance of our society to produce even more heterogeneity. It's the pleasure, I call it the pleasure of the difference, pleasure of the difference within the society itself. Major and then that will be very fast. Uh, today, creolization of values, uh, spiritual values have changed a lot. Uh, this, just a word about that. What is it? Ten minutes, okay. Uh, a few things about uh, virtuality and reality. That's very, very important. Uh, I think that uh, I'm asking how uh, the uh, thousand friends we have on Facebook, friends in the same sense and as the ones uh, we have in uh, the workplace, in the neighborhood, uh, uh, the gang members on the street and all that. Probably this is different. The fact that the space is also experienced now in a very continuous way, uh, immediacy, we get the answer. And uh, I was watching Bo being connected with Germany and I don't know where, and uh, uh, immediate answer, and <laughs> that's very important. Internet, Twitter, and uh, all those technology and provide this instant, instantaneous access to others all over the planet. And time also has changed a lot. Um, this will be the key element in my, in my coming paper. It's uh, what sort of identity we produce uh, in our neoliberal society in which rights are so, so important, but also the idea that we are a society based on competition, on consumption, on communication, which are the key values of the Western world and that with values which are invading other societies and combining with the local, local values. And uh, then a few words about how to connect that uh, to uh, mental, mental health. I had a chance to work in, uh, and to do research here in Quebec and uh, uh, about uh, mental health problems in mining areas in the ABTB where you will find uh, three different types of communities, lumbering communities, then essentially communities. People are working, uh, uh, cutting trees. The, they are lumberjacks and all that, and we studied. Uh, the particular problems of mental health they have. Also miners, then the mining activities, very important uh, in that uh, region. And farmers, then, when you compare that within. And then also we did uh, research in villages along in the northern uh, uh, coast uh, along the St. Lawrence where you find fishermen and uh, activities related to the sea, you know, fishing activities. And uh, you realize that there are uh, differences uh, there. And as well, of course, we have worked in large uh, cities. And essentially, I'm absolutely convinced that we have to go on uh, in our traditional approach. Uh, in using a cultural, a cultural framework. This is, for me, absolutely, absolutely fundamental. But culture in that context will have to be made more complex, much more complex than we used to do. Community approach, social approach. What's our cultures? Culture, essentially, what, what really matters is a social life. The cultures are just representation that circulates up and a social organization. It's more conceptual, representational, and all that. And then we have to deal with the family structure, how it's organized, 
the class structure of the society, and so on, and so on. And the third element, the phenomenological approach in the sense of the experience. How people go through chronic uh, disorder or the experiment that, and as well, of, of course, what they have to say. Is it possible to produce a narrative that makes sense? The complaints, are we ready to hear the complaint the way then the experience of the disease? Right? We have to assess very seriously the role of genetics and brain in the genesis of mental health problems. I've given much time to, I wrote a book about genomics and proteomics and trying to uh, oppose, one minute, yeah, to oppose to those reductionistic approach. And now I'm finishing one about neuroscience and uh, the way we look at the brain. Mental problems are not a disease of the brain, much more complex than that. Disease of the full person, even in its or interrelation to other. It's a disease of the mind as well, disease of the person. And uh, of course, then the interconnection. What is local culture and a H? What I said, what they say to one another. The universal, we need words to think. And the glossary we are using today, particularly those opposition, nature, culture, universality, particularity, I think they are not adequate. We have to develop a new vocabulary, a new glossary to look at that. I am proposing here three terms. Really distinguish, to distinguish between universal, uniforms, and commons. And essentially, I think the way to go is to insist more and more on translation. Translation is the only possible ethics in our global age. A dialogue of culture rather than a clash of civilization. Thank you.